I think I uh, will start with like setting the scene uh, a little bit about the deep sea, uh, which is quite different from uh, what we know from uh, our visits to the seashores. And then after me, uh, Nils will uh, continue with the, uh, uh, the new ocean treaty. Okay, um, I have to move that way a bit. Okay, so uh, the deep sea, as I said, is very different from uh, the shallow areas. Um, hmm. We um, at, in the in the shelf areas or the shallow areas. Uh, we have a lot of nutrients and uh, a lot of uh, green algae growth. Um, most of that uh, growth, most of that carbon ends up on the seafloor and uh, you get uh, lots of food giving uh, nutrients to uh, a lot of life, a lot of fauna. The deep sea uh, away from the shelf areas of <coughs> the shallow seas, um, we have much, much less nutrients um, and, and the, the production, the green algae production is uh, used in the, in the surface waters and very, very little uh, food reaches the sea floor and uh, that uh, means that uh, there are very few animals on the sea floor they are often very small most of them at least and they are far apart they are rare but in contrary to what we thought some time ago and uh, what maybe many people think this fauna is very very species rich uh, compared to shelf fauna so um, compared to the number of animals living down there they belong to uh, many different species and this is just one example uh, uh, of the Two of these species, they are not uh, uh, typical because they are relatively large. Most of the animals, most of the diversity lives in, in the sediment, as you can see next to this. So what we see here is one sea cucumber eating sediment on the surface of the seafloor and you can see a polychaete. Uh, commensal or just ending up sitting on on this uh, sea cucumber we don't know but the typical uh, charismatic uh, deep sea fauna these guys all right so what is the the deep sea anyway uh, we know now that it's nutrient poor and uh, but very diverse but uh, what what uh, what is it really uh, in terms of geography? We know that uh, around 70% of the planet's surface is ocean, salt water. Uh, the shelves are around 9% of that uh, area. And then continental slopes with interesting canyons make up another 5% of the total ocean surface. The, this image here is from the one of the best mapped slope area in the world uh, off Monterey Bay in uh, Southern California. Um, we also have sea mounts uh, dotting the deep sea floor, but they, they are numerous thousands of seamounts, but they make up a very small area. 
There are mid-ocean ridges where new seafloor is formed. Uh, in all the oceans, we have mid-ocean ridges. There are also uh, examples of um, ephemeral habitats like vents and seeps and, uh, and whale falls, like in this image, but they are really rare uh, and make up less than uh, one uh, tenth of a percentage of the total seafloor. All of these um, habitats are um, relatively, relative to the, the rest of the oceans, uh, qual quite well known. Even the Heydal trenches, so below 6,000 meters, including uh, the Mariana Trench, but uh, there are trenches in most oceans, are now relatively well known, uh, with a massive effort lately to study them. But the abyssal plains, uh, the remaining 80% of the ocean, are not uh, really investigated. We know very, very little about the fauna uh, and ecosystems on this part of the ocean. And this part, the abyssal plains, is uh, really what this uh, new ocean treaty is about. And this is just another little image of um, an example of the fauna living out there. Uh, a sea cucumber again. Uh, many sea cucumbers on the uh, deep sea floor are able to take leaps out into the water and swim around a bit or drift. Okay. Um, so. Uh, an effective management of this, uh, including the areas beyond national jurisdiction, uh, needs evidence-based environmental monitoring. So we need to know who lives there to be able to uh, manage these areas. And that uh, knowledge is called, uh, or that science is called taxonomy. We need to know where else they live, these animals, to be able to say if they are rare or if they are um, threatened by extinction, if, for example, if, if they are endemic in a, in a site, that is by a geography. We need to know if they are able to come back after a, a disturbance from um, oil and gas exploitation or uh, deep sea mining, that is uh, uh, connectivity. And we need to know roughly what uh, role they play in the ecosystem. And by n natural history, you can sort of figure out what they are doing by uh, knowing if they are filter feeding or predators or scavenging. And we need to know so we need to put all this knowledge in open access databases so that uh, managers around the world and colleagues uh, doing the same thing can uh, access the data. And uh, this is just examples of uh, some other of the animals. Most of these guys lives in the sediment, but there are also examples of corals that sits on hard structures like this one. Okay. So, um, I said that uh, the deep sea is not well known, and how do you go about to, to um, protect this unknown? There is one strategy, actually, uh, by creating a network of representative protected areas uh, based on the model on the biodiversity and ecosystem spatial distribution uh, by using best available science. Um, we can create a network. This example is from the one area beyond national jurisdiction covered by the International Seabird Authority where 
they are managing the deep sea mineral resources. And here uh, they enforced areas of particular environmental interests. Uh, so 13 of these areas are covering what we believe are uh, the biodiversity and ecosystems in these areas. So, so based on very little data, but the data we have, um, this network has been made uh, to sort of protect the diversity in this uh, area. Okay, um, I think with that I leave to uh, the word to Nils to uh, um, carry on with the Ocean Treaty. Yeah, thank you very much for that, Thomas. I think that that really sets the scene and explains uh, what we're trying to set out to protect in this agreement. Uh, and thanks in particular for all the good pictures of these fascinating creatures that we lawyers uh, get to see uh, far too seldom. <laughs> so thank you very much for that. So <clears throat> I will explain just shortly uh, the significance of this new global agreement, which was concluded quite recently, uh, where we stand right now, uh, and what it actually means in terms of legal obligations. Um, and then I, of course, leave it to uh, natural scientists to assess whether these legal undertakings are sufficient or, or indeed appropriate uh, in order to ensure the conservations of the species we're discussing here. So, first of all, uh, this new agreement is a rather historic one. Uh, it was concluded in March uh, this year, the 4th of March, over, after over 15 years of negotiations in, in different formats at the UN. Uh, it was agreed uh, by consensus, which is noteworthy, I think, especially in light of uh, the depressing state uh, of geopolitics at the moment. Uh, and that is really, really uh, a, an important success and also a sign of strength for the UN system in a very difficult time. Uh, so the agreement was uh, agreed in March uh, and it has been open for signature since the 20th of September this year. Uh, over 80 states have already signed it. Sweden was one of the first states to sign it. And of course, signing uh, an international law agreement does not make you legally obliged to follow its obligation, but at least it indicates a will to implement domestic legislation and to subsequently ratify the agreement. Uh, and once 60 states have ratified the agreement, uh, it will enter into force and states will become legally bound uh, to implement its provisions. So that's sort of where we are right now. States, including Sweden, are trying to figure out what this means uh, for our uh, national legislation, what we will need to change and amend in order to enable us to ratify and, and live up to its obligations. All states can become part of it and uh, whether or not uh, they're parties to uh, the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, which is the much broader framework which this BBNJ agreement, so to speak, builds on. It is referred to in different ways. The BBNJ agreement uh, means the agreement for biological diversity in uh, marine areas beyond national jurisdiction. That is the formal name. It's also often referred to as the High Seas Treaty, or so the Global Ocean Treaty. Um, so many different names. Um, it's important to uh, just explain shortly at least where it applies. Um, it's quite complex in legal terms, but I will try to sum it up quite briefly. This is not an agreement for all of the world's oceans. It's an agreement for areas beyond national jurisdiction. And that means the part of the seas where states do not have sovereign rights. Um, this means that it is the areas which, looking at the water column, lies uh, in most areas beyond the 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone. That is what we commonly call the high seas. 
Uh, and in the seabed, it is the parts of the seabed which lies beyond the continental shelf. I think Thomas, at the start of his presentation, had a good picture of what the seabed usually looks like with the continental shelf going steeply down, away out from the coast. So this is an agreement for these common uh, ocean areas where all states, at least formally, are equal. Um, so they're defined negatively once states have made their legitimate claims for maritime areas. This is sort of what's left behind. And these are no small areas. They represent two thirds of the world's oceans measured in surface and 95% measured in volume. So, I mean, a very, very big share of the world's ocean and in, indeed of, of the global biosphere. Um, if we look at the material content or the substance of the agreement, it contains very different elements. It's often discussed and it has been often discussed in, in media here in Sweden as an environmental agreement. And that is certainly true, but that is only one part of it. Uh, it aims to promote certain environmental objectives for sure. Uh, most importantly, perhaps it provides global rules for establishing marine protected areas and also processes to ensure uh, that environmental impact assessments are conducted. But it also is an agreement to promote a more equal access to the global ocean areas. The technology and the capacity to use resources in these areas to conduct marine science uh, and also to engage in environmental protection is in reality today limited to a very small number of rich states. This agreement sets out to break this inequality and empower the global south and promote their poor countries' marine capacities. It is also an agreement to regulate the use of marine life for other purposes than fisheries. Importantly, it establishes global rules for something which is called marine genetic resources. Uh, and this relates to the harvesting of marine organisms, not for food consumption, but for developing innovations based on bioactive properties. That is to say, when you bring something up for the seas, not to eat it, but instead to explore it and use it uh, to uh, develop science and perhaps develop products. Uh, there have been high hopes for pharmaceuticals and other biotechnological developments to be developed based on, based on these resources. Um, and to continue a bit with this interesting concept of marine genetic uh, resources, it connects to three factors uh, and the interest for these uh, marine genetic resources connects to three factors. First of all, uh, life in the seas is much more genetically diverse than life on land. It is also much less explored, although we have ambitious scientists like Thomas looking at these areas. Uh, the vast, I mean, they're, they're largely unexplored. Um, we know more about the surface of the moon and of Mars than we know of these uh, deep sea areas. Um, and for these reasons, um, I should also say that the conditions, which in, in many places are very hostile in the deep seas, also has forced life to develop habits, which, which you don't see elsewhere. All of these characteristics have made life pretty interesting to explore in these areas from a biotechnological standpoint. Um, and for a long time, states had very different positions on the legality on using uh, these common genetic resources uh, for innovations. From the global south, it was considered that these resources were common and shouldn't be able to be used for commercial purposes without sharing the benefits. From the global north, on the other hand, many states argued that everyone would benefit from developing fancy innovations. Uh, uh, and they sort of argued for a very open approach to, to using genetic resources. What we in the end got in the agreement, uh, what was a rather rigorous procedure for notification uh, and transparency in relation to activities carried out in relation to genetic resources. Whenever anyone uh, is to uh, conduct scientific operations or any other sort of activity relating to genetic resources, they must notify a global body set up under this agreement. And once you're back 
to shore in the laboratory or perhaps in your research facility. You need to report what you've found, what you've carried out, etc. So it actually establishes quite a bit of red tape or uh, reporting uh, obligations on behalf of, of, of researchers engaged in this process. So perhaps for researchers such as Thomas, it will involve a bit of paperwork. And this aims to serve two purposes. First of all, it uh, aims to promote transparency. Databases will be set up with uh, research collections. Uh, it will be easier to figure out what's going on out there in terms of science, etc. But it is also supposed to uh, inform uh, the parties to the, uh, this agreement of what profits actually are made on these genetic resources. And under this agreement, there is actually an opportunity uh, to decide to adopt a global tax for the use of genetic resources. Um, that decision can be made by, by qualified majority under the agreement. However, the default option is that uh, resource uh, use of genetic resources is not taxed instead uh, the developed states under the agreement the rich states undertake to finance a special fund to promote capacity building and technology transfer to the global south there will be a lot of money under this agreement to develop uh, marine capacity and promote biological diversity uh, the most perhaps discussed part of the agreement is the one relating to marine protected areas uh, for long, it has been considered by scientists that establishing marine protected areas, that is to say limiting human activities in ecologically and biologically important and sensitive sea areas, represent perhaps the most important tool to protect the marine environment. There have also been processes under other convention, the Convention for Biological Diversity, uh, which have sort of figured out or established which areas are most important to conserve from a biological standpoint. But so far, the legal tools for doing that have been lacking. But importantly, in this agreement, such a procedure is established. So uh, by means of a rather rigorous process whereby states can nominate marine protected areas and then assess the proposals scientifically, discuss them and eventually make a decisions. Uh, decisions can then be made under this agreement for marine protected areas, which all parties to the agreement are then obliged uh, to recognize. And this also includes the measures adopted connected to the agreement. Um, marine governance is very fragmentized, uh, fragmented. Uh, different marine organizations have mandate uh, to regulate different activities in the seas. And this agreement really tries to bring them together in a concerted manner to protect the marine environment. So when it comes to marine protected areas, this agreement will sort of ask other marine organizations to get involved. And I think this is perhaps its most important uh, potentially, uh, potential role, is to serve as an arena for a more coherent and integrated marine management. So when it comes to marine protected areas, this could, for instance, mean that once uh, a decision has been made to establish a marine protected area under the BBNJ agreement, uh, the International Maritime Organization can contribute to it by establishing specific measures in relation to shipping. Regional Fisheries Management Organization could close the areas to fisheries, etc., etc. So this is really a vehicle to bring everyone on board uh, in order to protect the most sensitive and biologically important sea areas. Uh, just a few words on environmental impact assessment. There is already uh, at the forehand uh, an obligation for states to conduct environmental impact assessment under the UN Convention for the Law of the Sea, but this agreement sets out a more, much more rigorous and much more detailed process. Once this agreement has been entered into force, uh, states are obliged to actually quite rigorously assess the environmental implications of whatever they want to carry out in these uh, parts of the oceans. And that's really important, not only for these parts of the oceans, but I think it will also help out in uh, promoting this concept of EIAs in uh, also domestic legislation. So that's really important. Um, I've already mentioned that part of uh, the task of this agreement and part of the objective is to promote uh, greater marine capacity in the global south. 
it does so by a number of, of, of different uh, uh, processes. It sets out a very needs driven approach, um, assessing the needs in developing countries and trying to making sure that they get the right resources uh, to get involved in um, the use of marine resources, uh, the management of the marine environment, etc., and to enable them to carry out these administratively quite burdensome processes of, of environmental impact assessment. There will be a lot of money in this agreement. Developed countries uh, have already undertaken to finance it quite substantially. There will also be a lot of private money under the agreement. So we're really hoping that this will be a vehicle for marine conservation. Um, just a final word, if you find words on how it will function in practice, it is an agreement under international law. That is to say, it makes states obliged to live up under to its obligations. And the basic concept for making sure that states live up to their obligations under the law of the sea is the flag states principle. So since most of the operations uh, carried out in these activities in these areas are carried out by ships it will be the flag state of the relevant vessel which will be determinant as well as potentially the nationality of uh, people involved in these ocean areas so it's really important to get the important flag states on board uh, to the agreement it's not only a cooperative agreement, there is possibility for dispute settlement under the agreement. That is to say, one state has the possibility to ultimately bring another one which does not live up to its obligations before dispute settlement in case uh, it, is not, uh, it does not fulfill its obligation. So, in many regards, uh, important substantial legal provision and beyond that, perhaps even more importantly, it sets up uh, a global uh, organization, a global vehicle for integrated marine governance, uh, which has been long, uh, longed. Um, and, and just as a final note, perhaps in addition to its implications for marine management, this agreement is, is really important as a sign of strength, as I said at the start, for the UN system. It is quite noteworthy that a global agreement uh, is uh, negotiated and has been adopted in, in dark times as these. But I think I'll end here and uh, perhaps get back for questions and perhaps, a ref I don't know, reflections from Thomas, perhaps, relating to the scientific stuff. Please, thank you.